This program is brought to you by Emory University. Uh, our speaker this morning is John Ricketts. John is one of our second year fellows in the clinical track. John is a native Alabaman, uh, grew up in Birmingham, uh, went to the University of Alabama, then University of South Alabama for medical school, came to Emory for residency, um, and is going to talk today about uh, HIV and cardiovascular disease. Dr. Ricketts. All right, thanks so much, Dr. Williams. I, I'm sure you're glad to see I remember to put my name on the title slide this year. Um, so this is a topic that is something that's very near and dear to me um, as somebody who grew up as the child of a physician who trained in the mid to late 80s. It was always really impressed on me growing up how important it was to, to take care of HIV patients. Um, in residency here, I spent a lot of time doing specialized training in the care of HIV patients and graduated with a distinction in HIV care. Um, and so this really combines two of my big areas of interest, which is, of course, cardiovascular disease, but also HIV. I have nothing to disclose. So for our learning objectives today, um, I want to review the history and mechanisms of HIV and its treatment. I want us to learn a little bit about different types of cardiovascular disease caused by HIV infection as well as its treatment. And I want to discuss available treatment options, best practices, and future pathways for cardiovascular disease prevention in these patients. So introduction, how did we get to where we are today? So we'll start off with a brief history lesson. Uh, and like most horrible things that happened in the 20th century, HIV also begins with a 19th century European monarch. Uh, in this case, Leopold II, who in 1865 ascends the throne of Belgium. Um, he's interested in joining this list of colonial powers in Europe. And in 1885, he stakes a claim to modern day Democratic Republic of Congo, which was then named the Congo Free State and establishes the capital of Leopold in modern day Kinshasa. Um, in the 1890s, luckily for him, the price of rubber skyrockets due to increased demand. The Congo Free State has these huge natural supplies of rubber and switches its focus from ivory to rubber harvesting. Uh, you have forced labor for rubber harvesting and infrastructure construction leading to widespread disruption of traditional living conditions. Many people are forced from their traditional villages into forests to both log rubber and try and hide from colonial forces. Um, labor camps and urbanization result in extremely high population densities of young single males, which as it would anywhere else in the world, attracts lots of prostitutes. And you have new railways and steamboat lines that connect rural and urban environments as they'd never been before this time. Sometime in the 19-teens to 1920s, uh, Bantu Man in southeastern Cameroon, and we actually have data that pinpoints this location pretty accurately, experiences blood-blood contact with a chimpanzee he's field dressing for food, and SIV, or simian in immunodeficiency virus, crosses over and mutates into HIV. Uh, he or somebody he's transmitted it to makes their way down the Sangha River to Leopoldville. Uh, and from 1920 to 1935, at this same time as this is really starting to blossom, there's a French campaign to vaccinate against sleeping sickness taking place in this area. They're vaccinating between 60,000 and 600,000 people a year. Uh, and there is no sterile technique. And when I say there is no sterile technique, at one point in time, they used six syringes to vaccinate 90,000 people. Um, by 1930, HIV-1 strain M has established itself in Kinshasa and begins to spread. In 1959, we have our first confirmed HIV infection that's discovered in a tissue sample of a Bantu man named ZA-59, uh, which is found in a freezer in a research laboratory, actually by one of our uh, researchers here at Emory. And then in 1960, Congo earns its independence and is renamed Zaire. Uh, foreign aid workers flood into the country to assist with its new independence, which is an effort led by the UN. And soon after this, an aid worker who's likely a teacher returns to Haiti from Zaire, bringing HIV-1 strain M subgroup B, which is the so-called pandemic strain and the main strain of HIV that's found outside of Africa to this day with them. Uh, by the mid to late 1960s, HIV-1 has entered the United States. And we know this because in 1968, a teenager named Robert Rayford presented to Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis with severe lower extremity edema, ultimately is found to have Kaposi sarcoma and passes away. Uh, in the late 1980s, one of the clinicians who actually published a case report on this back in the 60s, realized that they had preserved some of the tissue samples, went back and tested it and discovered that in fact, he was positive for HIV in the United States in 1968. Uh, during the 1970s, HIV establishes a foothold in the gay communities of New York and San Francisco, as well as among Haitian immigrants. 
Uh, in 1980, Gaten Dugas, who is the famous French flight attendant for Man the Band Played On, uh, makes his first known visit to a bathhouse in New York City. So although this narrative was really pushed for a long time, you can see this was already a fait accompli by the time that he was getting started. And then on June 6, 1981, the CDC publishes a cluster of pneumocystis pneumonia cases in five gay men in San Francisco, really setting off the, the age of HIV as we know it. Um, throughout the 1980s, the epidemic scope becomes apparent as millions of people in the U.S. and around the world begin to succumb to the complications of HIV and AIDS. Now, in 1987, Zadobudine, or AZT, is announced by the FDA, and this is the first drug that's been designed to fight the HIV virus. However, resistance to the drug develops quickly, and really its clinical efficacy is pretty limited. Uh, in 1994, trials were published showing that two non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, so AZT is a nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, um, reduced this incidence of resistance in patients on AZT. And then by 1996, a new class of drugs called protease inhibitors are announced, which leads to the advent of triple drug therapy, or the so-called drug cocktail, or highly active antiretroviral therapy, also known as HART. So let's talk a little epidemiology. Um, as of 2018, approximately 38 million people are infected by HIV globally, results in about 770,000 deaths per year, and more than 30,000 deaths since this was first recognized in the early 80s. Um, approximately 1.2 million people in the United States are living with HIV. Uh, and in Atlanta metro area, there are about 38,000 people living with HIV with roughly 1,600 new cases a year. Now that means that in our catchment area of the Atlanta metro area, we cover about one in 30 HIV patients in the United States. Uh, and I, I wasn't able to find this, but I did have an ID attending once tell me that in the city of Atlanta, if you're an African-American man who has sex with other men, by the time you're 40 years old, there's about a 40% chance you have HIV. So I, I want to just establish some definitions real quick. We're gonna be talking about a lot of non-cardiovascular things in this talk, uh, namely resolving around HIV, and I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page. So human immunodeficiency virus, it's a retrovirus from the genus lentivirus, is a single-stranded positive sense enveloped RNA virus, and it contains reverse transcriptase and protease, um, reverse transcriptase to convert its RNA into double-stranded DNA, as well as a series of other proteins we'll go over in just a second. Acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, or AIDS, is an HIV patient with a CD4 count less than 200 or an AIDS-defining illness. CD4 cells are T helper cells that are used to signal other immune cells versus CD8 cells, which do more of the actual cellular killing. Antiretroviral therapy, or ART, are medications that are specifically targeted at different points in the HIV replication cycle. And heart, or highly active antiretroviral therapy, is a combination of three antiretroviral drugs, the most common regimens including two NRTIs, plus either a protease inhibitor, an NNRTI, an integrase inhibitor, or a CCR5 or fusion inhibitor. Uh, now, I know this has really taken a lot of people back, probably never thought that they would see a slide like this again, um, but just to briefly run through the life cycle of HIV, so it starts at the top with the fusion of the mature virus particle into the cell. Um, this virion releases its single-stranded RNA, reverse transcriptase integrase, and other proteins into the cell. Reverse transcriptase binds to that RNA and turns it into double-stranded DNA, which is then transported into the nucleus, and integrase integrates that double-stranded DNA into the host DNA where it's then replicated into RNA, which creates proteins as well as the viral RNA itself. All of this is packaged in the cell membrane and released as a new mature virion. As far as our antiretroviral drugs and where they are effective, it starts with our fusion inhibitors and CCR5 inhibitors, which prevent virus fusion into the cell. Our most popular drugs are our nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors as well as non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So up here I've listed a few of the common drugs in these classes and then in parentheses are combo pills that these drugs are found in. Um, and so both of these work on the reverse transcriptase uh, stage, preventing that RNA from being transcribed into double-stranded DNA. Integrase inhibitors are sort of the hot new kids on the block as far as antiretroviral therapy, and they work to prevent the integration of that double-stranded DNA into the host cell DNA. And then protease inhibitors were that third class of drugs to come out, still rather popular. And what they do is they prevent protein activity within the newly released virion, so basically prevent it from ever becoming a mature virus. So from the time of its discovery through the first two decades of the pandemic, HIV invariably leads to AIDS, which is exceedingly fatal. Uh, with the advent of heart, HIV has changed from a fatal disease to really more of a chronic medical condition. 
And if heart is started early enough at this time, the life expectancy of a 20-year-old with HIV now exceeds 70 years. Uh, and although they're living longer, individuals on heart are now subject to more chronic non-AIDS conditions, importantly cardiovascular disease, but also things like cancer, kidney disease, liver disease, and neurocognitive disease. And so when thinking about cardiovascular disease in the setting of HIV, it's really helpful to divide it into two main categories, and that's sort of <coughs> cardiovascular disease and HIV pre-heart and post-heart. In the pre-heart area, most patients would die from infectious complications long before cardiovascular disease had time to set in. So most of the cardiovascular disease in these patients was related to the breakdown of the immune system. You see things like large pericardial effusions, pulmonary hypertension, endocarditis, myocarditis, cardiomyopathy. Um, and the prevalence of pericardial effusions in these patients ranged anywhere from 11 to 40 percent. Think about large infectious pleural effu or pericardial infusions, um, cancer-related pericardial effusions. Pulmonary hypertension was six to 12 times more prevalent in these patients than in non-HIV-infected patients, and cardiomyopathy was widely prevalent, occurring in anywhere from 16.6 percent of AIDS patients in one study to another study that pegged it anywhere from 35 to 38 percent. Although some of this is idiopathic, many of the cases are de derived from underlying myocarditis and valvular dysfunction due to endocarditis. However, even once we started to get these patients on therapy with dur durable control of their HIV replication, we still saw an increased risk in a range of cardiovascular disease. So in high-income countries, cardiovascular disease is the second non-AIDS cause of death in people living with HIV. And one early study showed that twice as many people living with HIV on heart had an estimated 10-year Framingham risk of greater than 20 percent to compare to control patients. And another early study also showed that the risk of cardiovascular events due to HIV-infected individuals uh, increased with age, with a median 10-year risk of over 20 percent in individuals who were 50 years old, which early on suggested that increased duration of life due to heart had a significant impact on cardiovascular disease in these patients. So enough about the introduction. Let's get into the actual pathogenesis. How is cardiovascular disease caused by HIV? So as it emerged that these patients were still at higher risk for cardiovascular disease, even after we had them on uh, medications, researchers really struggled to find out what the underlying mechanisms were. To be honest, to this day, it's still not completely understood, but we have a pretty good idea. And initial efforts focused on a higher prevalence of traditional risk factors in these patients, like smoking, lipid abnormalities, and substance abuse. Um, research then shifted to focus on the antiretroviral drugs themselves, mainly due to associations between lipid dystrophies um, and some ART medications. However, the most recent studies show that chronic inflammation is the most likely cause of this persistent increased risk of cardiovascular disease in patients with HIV, even when their disease is optimally controlled. So let's talk a little about these traditional risk factors. Um, so early in the post-heart era, researchers really theorized that all of this excess risk in HIV patients was due to a higher frequency among that cohort of traditional risk factors, and this is true. Um, several studies have shown that dyslipidemia, fat redistribution, insulin resistance, and smoking were all more prevalent in patients with HIV. There was one review that showed that the prevalence of HIV risk factors in HIV patients versus non-HIV patients in developed countries, and what they found was that HIV patients have higher smoking rates, they have lower LDL, higher, or, sorry, lower HDL, higher LDL, and higher triglycerides, they have more hypertension, and they have more cocaine use, all of which can lead to cardiovascular disease. However, data began to show that even when adjusting for traditional risk factors, there was still a significant excess cardiovascular disease risk with HIV patients compared to non-HIV patients. In this one study looked at the VA cohort. You'll see a lot of data in my talk today from these VA cohorts. It's been a real gold mine of information. There are a ton of patients in it, and they're followed really well. And so in this study, they looked at over 55,000 uninfected patients versus over 27,000 HIV patients. They developed three separate models. So the first model is really adjusted just for demographic characteristics. The second model, they adjusted for demographics as well as Framingham score. And for the third model, they adjusted for both of those plus a variety of other covariants they looked at, as you can see along that top line, no matter what they adjust for, these patients with HIV still have a higher hazard ratio, anywhere from 1.5 to 1.7 for cardiovascular diseases compared to non-infected patients, and that's when adjusting for Framingham and a variety of traditional risk factors. So at the same time that researchers were publishing these results, data was emerging about possible associations between cardiovascular disease and heart itself. Um, so a reminder, this highly active antiretroviral therapy, our most combination is two NRTIs plus a protease inhibitor, an NRTI, an integrase inhibitor, a CCR5 inhibitor. Um, and in a meta-analysis published in 2012, they showed that heart imposed a greater CVD risk in people with HIV. 
Interesting that relative risk for cardiovascular disease was one and a half in HIV patients on therapy versus HIV patients not on therapy. And it also showed a relative risk of two for cardiovascular disease in uh, HIV patients on therapy as opposed to HIV uninfected patients. And different drugs were found to have differing risk profiles. So early side effect profiles of the protease inhibitors were known to cause varied metabolic profiles, um, most famous of which is probably lipodystrophy, which you get lipoatrophy in the face and limbs, as well as lipohypertrophy with visceral fat gain and fat deposition in the neck. Um, I was told we're not allowed to call it a buffalo hump anymore, but it's a buffalo hump. Um, dyslipidemia and insulin resistance were all common with protease inhibitors, and all of these are known risk factors for the development of cardiovascular disease and coronary artery disease in particular. There were other PIs that were found to have a direct relation to an increased risk of ACS as well. Now, older NRTIs such as zidobudine, stavudine, and didanosine all induce dyslipidemia and insulin resistance. However, newer NRTIs like tenofovir, lamivudine, and emtricitabine, the latter two of which were actually developed here at Emory, don't appear to be associated with these effects. Other classes of antiretrovirals like NNRTIs, integrase inhibitors, and CCR5 inhibitors all appear to have a pretty favorable cardiac profile. Overall, protease inhibitors and NRTIs are associated with a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. So the relative risk for cardiovascular disease with a protease inhibitor is about 1.1 per year on therapy, and an NRTI is 1.05 per year on therapy. Now, these are low numbers, but remember, like we talked about earlier in the talk, these are drugs these patients are going to be on for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years even. And with that relative risk per year, this is significant risk over their lifetime. So despite these risks, the results of the strategies for management of antiretroviral or SMART study really shifted the focus from ARVs as the main culprit of cardiovascular disease risk. So they randomized over 5,000 patients on antiretroviral therapy with a CD4 count over 350 cells to either continued antiretroviral therapy or interrupted treatment until their CD4 dropped below 250. They found that patients who interrupted antiretroviral therapy actually had a 70% increased hazard of cardiovascular disease as compared to those who continued treatment. There were other studies that showed that patients with lower nadir CD4 counts were, was associated with increased risk, and further studies that showed increased risk with both low CD4 counts and high viral loads. And so due to these demonstrated benefits in CVD risk from early heart and avoidance of heart interruption, research start looking for other mechanisms. And ultimately, chronic inflammation has kind of emerged as a key factor. And so even though heart reduces the amount of inflammation in these patients, even virologically suppressed patients have higher levels of inflammatory markers than individuals without HIV. So to sort of touch on what inflammation means in HIV, the hallmark of immune activation in HIV infection is depletion and dysfunction of CD4 cells, as well as chronic activation of CD8 cells. So remember CD4, those T helper cells, they really signal other immune mechanisms. CD8 cells are more of those natural killer cells and cells that promote cell death themselves. So CD4 levels less than 500, high CD8 counts, and lower CD4 to CD8 ratios are all associated with cardiovascular disease risk. Amplified monocyte <coughs> macrophage-mediated inflammation and injury within atherosclerotic lesions due to HIV infection also increases this risk. And in particular, activation of both intermediate and pro-inflammatory CD14 and CD16 monocytes has been linked to increased risk in HIV patients even after adjusting for traditional risk factors. Now, there are three main suspected culprits when it comes to chronic inflammation, and that's subclinical viremia, microbial translocation, and viral co-infections. So we'll touch on each of these just briefly. Um, even among patients who are optimally controlled on heart, there remains a low level of viremia. One study demonstrated that while not as high as in HIV patients, not on antiretroviral therapy, HIV patients with viral suppression, as well as a certain category called elite controllers, which are unique patients able to control their CD4 counts and viral loads without medication, all maintain higher CD8 T cell activation than non-infected patients. These low levels of virus in the body will continue to activate these immune mechanisms, even in patients who are optimally treated. As far as microbial translocation, so-called leaky gut syndrome, it occurs when the defense mechanisms of the GI tract are impaired, which allows microbes to get into the bloodstream. In these patients, you have disrupted tight junctions due to increased endothelial cell apoptosis. You have loss of mucosal immunity and presence of HIV in the gut itself despite heart. And in vitro studies show that elevated levels of lipopolysaccharide, which is a marker of bacteremia, induces tissue factor expression in monocytes, which causes CD8 activation, increased D-dimer levels, and elevated risk of thrombosis. 
Studies show that microbial translocation is attenuated in heart, but it's still <coughs> present even in these patients when they're optimally treated. As far as co-infections concerned, over 90% of HIV patients are co-infected with CMV, which is independently associated with an increased immune response. Uh, one trial showed that HIV patients on heart who are treated with Valgan cyclovir, which is CMV-specific antiviral, um, had immune activation drop significantly as compa compared to placebo and remained lower even after treatment, although it was never going to be as low as in non-HIV-infected patients. In patients who are co-infected with HHV-8, which is a vasculotropic virus associated with Kaposi sarcoma, they showed significantly elevated markers of inflammation like CRP and CD8 after adjustment for traditional risk factors, hep C and HSV-2 co-infection. There's also evidence that co-infection with cardiotropic viruses like Epstein-Barr can contribute to HIV cardiomyopathy. So far, we've shown that HIV infection, even when optimally controlled, can lead to increased levels of chronic inflammation. And it's also been demonstrated ad nauseum that chronic inflammation leads to cardiovascular disease. But can we link this chronic inflammation caused by uh, HIV to cardiovascular disease? And the answer is yes. Um, so even after adjusting for traditional risk factors as well as HIV-related risk factors and despite long-term therapy, HIV patients still have elevated levels of biomarkers compared to non-HIV patients. And among HIV patients on stable heart, their baseline levels of IL-6, TNF-alpha, CD14, and D-dimer were all associated with increased mortality, risk of MI, and risk of stroke. And in one systematic review, it looked at eight studies comparing inflammatory biomarkers in car uh, cardiovascular disease, CAD, MI, stroke, as well as surrogate markers like arterial stiffness and carotid intermedia thickness um, in patients with HIV. What they found was that CRP, IL-6, and D-dimer were the most frequently assessed in these studies, and all three of these were associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease in these patients. One study found that higher IL-6, D-dimer, and CRP levels were associated with a greater risk of fatal cardiovascular disease, as well as all-cause mortality beyond 28 days after a non-fatal event. And CD14 was associated with increased mortality in HIV patients, but not necessarily increased CVD risk. The Multicenter AIDS Cohort Study, or MAX, studied inflammatory biomarkers and cardiovascular disease risk in their cohort. And they showed that HIV-positive men had higher rates of IL-6, ICAM-1, CRP, TNF-alpha, as well as a higher prevalence of non-calcified plaque on coronary CTA. The increased IL-6, ICAM-1, and TNF-alpha were all associated with an increased prevalence of coronary stenosis, and all but ICAM-1 were associated with a greater coronary artery calcium score. They also found that soluble CD163, CD14, and CCL2 were significantly elevated in HIV-positive men treated with heart, and all were significantly associated with atherosclerosis. This is the first time we'll kind of dip our toe into this idea of different types of plaque in HIV patients. And what they found was that with CD163, those patients were associated with higher coronary calcium, mixed plaque, and calcified plaque, whereas patients with higher CCL2 had higher rates of non-calcified plaque. So ultimately, we're left with this sort of multi-armed model for how HIV leads to cardiovascular disease. Patients with HIV have higher rates of traditional risk factors, which, of course, we know lead to cardiovascular disease. Patients who are on antiretroviral therapy have sort of this dual picture of, well, yes, it can directly lead to increased cardiovascular disease risk, but it also helps to reduce this chronic inflammation, which then can decrease the overall cardiovascular disease burden. And finally, HIV itself, with chronic inflammation due to co-infections, viremia, and microbial translocation, all lead to this chronic inflammatory state, which increases risk of cardiovascular disease in these patients. So now let's get into the nitty gritty that I'm sure most of the cardiologists in the room want to talk about, which are the manifestations of this cardiovascular disease in these patients. So there's a broad spectrum of cardiovascular disease in HIV patients, things like coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathy, there's conduction disease, pulmonary hypertension, pericardial disease, vasculopathy, and stroke. And all of these are at increased risk when compared to non-infected patients, even when controlled on antiretroviral therapy. So let's start with the big elephant in the room, the one that's probably most widely studied, and that's coronary artery disease. Um, so as we discussed earlier, HIV infection causes inflammation. There's one thing I want you to take from this talk today. HIV causes chronic inflammation, um, which in turn stimulates pro-atherogenic mechanisms. This increased inflammation leads to endothelial dysfunction, increases endothelial permeability, and promotes apoptosis. Um, the dysfunctional endothelium facilitates the entry of plasma lipids, where they're oxidized, ultimately penetrating the intima, leading to leukocyte recruitment and plaque formation via this well-established atherosclerotic pathway. 
Endothelial dysfunction also contributes to a hypercoagulable state with HIV replication itself, promoting coagulation in the presence of endothelial dysfunction by upregulating tissue factor pathways. And although the atherosclerotic process is similar in HIV patients compared to uninfected patients, there is an acceleration to this process that's seen in HIV patients. You have increased formation of non-calcified atypical plaques. I cannot stress this enough. HIV patients form non-calcified or mixed atypical plaques at a much higher rate as compared to the general population. And then due to the thin fibroatheroma caps on these atypical or lipid-rich plaques, they're extremely prone to erosion and rupture. Um, ultimately, this leads to a higher risk of coronary artery disease in patients with HIV. Now, how is this affected by antiretroviral therapy? Um, so as we discussed earlier, despite its overall positive effects, there is an association between certain ARVs and CAD that falls in two main classes, which are the protease inhibitors and the NRTIs. So as far as protease inhibitors are concerned, the data collection on adverse events of anti-HIV drugs, or much easier to say <coughs> DAD study, um, showed an increased risk of coronary artery disease with a lifetime cumulative exposure to some PIs, but not others such as sequinavir and alfenavir. Um, one case control study nested in the French hospital database on HIV cohort showed an odds ratio of about 1.15 for M MI for every year that a patient was exposed to any PI other than sequinavir. Um, and then another meta-analysis showed that not only is there a relative risk of about 2.1 for patients with recent exposure to PIs, but also there's an increased risk for MI with each additional year of exposure to certain PIs, um, like indenivir and lopinavir. Um, as far as the NRTIs, it's almost exclusively associated with abacavir, but the data is conflicting. Um, so the DAD study uh, showed that increased risk of MI with both recent and cumulative exposure to abacavir. Quebec's public health database showed an increased risk of MI with any exposure to abacavir. The French cohort showed no association with cumulative use, but did find a hazard ratio of two for MI for recent or exposure in less than the past year. And then a Kaiser cohort study found that HIV patients who initiated with abacavir were greater than two times as likely to experience an MI over two years as compared to HIV patients initiated without it, and that was adjusted for various other cardiovascular disease risk factors. So overall, these studies support the hypothesis that recent short-term exposure to abacavir may be associated with increased risk of cardiac events, and in art-naive patients, this may represent a significant immune activation and hypersensitivity reactivation um, that induces T-cell reactivity that's associated with the initiation of abacavir. Um, I have some thoughts myself. There's not a lot of data on it, but abacavir, it's a, it's a popular medicine. It's a good medicine, but it's notorious for having this Achilles heel where HIV can develop resistance to it with just one genetic mutation as compared to some of our newer integrase inhibitors and protease inhibitors that have barriers of resistance of up to 15 genetic mutations that have to form. So abacavir is sort of notorious for forming resistance, and it makes me wonder if this could just be a marker of, well, it's short-term exposure because patients are developing resistance to this. Um, and then reactivating their virus. Um, so even in patients with successful heart, they have a relative risk of one and a half to two of having an MI as compared to their HIV negative peers. Um, ACS is the most common clinical presentation of coronary artery disease in HIV patients, and the first manifestation occurs at a younger age, around 50 years old on average, and the most common presentation of ACS in these patients is STEMI, the prevalence of 57.2% based on one meta-analysis. So they're presenting younger, they're presenting sicker, and I uh, attribute a lot of that to those mixed or lipid-rich plaques that are extremely prone to rupture. Um, the degree of viremia and immune reconstitution appear to be related to the rates of ACS. There was one study that showed an association between a CD4 count of less than 200 in MI um, and a corroborating study that showed that a low CD4 nadir and high HIV RNA levels increased the risk of MI among patients with HIV. So medical management of ACS in patients with HIV is complicated by some significant interactions between antiretrovirals and antiplatelet agents. So clopidogrel levels are reduced by protease inhibitors and boosters, such as ritonavir and cobisostat, and increased by some NNRTIs. Ticagrelor levels are increased by PIs in their boosters, and they are dangerously reduced by certain NNRTIs. Um, because of this, prasugrel, which has reduced levels of his active metabolite but seems to have similar activity at baseline, is your recommended antiplatelet agent of choice in patients with HIV with ACS. Aspirin, unfractionated heparin, lovenox all have no interactions and are safe to use with any ART regimen.
What about PCI and cabbage? Um, one study showed no difference in short or long-term mortality with PCI or cabbage in HIV patients when compared to non-HIV patients. There was a prospective multicenter study that compared age and sex-matched HIV and infected and uninfected patients. It showed no difference in the rates of clinical restenosis or stent thrombosis at 12 months after a first episode of ACS. But it did show that HIV patients are more likely to prevent with recurrent ACS with a hazard ratio of six and a half and to undergo urgent PCI at one year follow up with an odds ratio of about 3.3. So for long term CAD management, first and foremost, we've got to address these traditional risk factors that are more common in these patients. That includes lifestyle modification, talking to them about diet and activity, smoking cessation, monitoring A1C, but especially monitoring blood pressure with these patients. So what's been shown is that even mild elevations in blood pressure in HIV patients lead to an increased risk of MI. And as this one study showed that even when you get into the pre-hypertension range, these HIV patients have significantly increased risk of MI unless we get them below that 120 systolic level. So these are patients you should be looking at treating their hypertension early and aggressively. Lipid management. Um, so the National Lipid Association recommends that HIV patients should be treated similar to the general population, but that HIV should be considered an additional risk factor for coronary artery disease in their risk stratification guide. Statins have traditionally been associated with significant ART interaction. There's been a lot of hemming and hawing over the years about should HIV patients be on statins? The answer is yes, um, but which statins should they be on? So atorvastatin and rosuvastatin can be first-line choices, except in patients on specific protease inhibitors for whom pitavastatin should be our statin of choice. There are several studies that show that rosuvastatin reduces markers of chronic inflammation in patients with HIV as well as lowering their LDL. Um, azetamibe has been shown to lower total cholesterol and LDL in HIV patients without any significant drug interactions. Alone, it reduces LDL from 5 to 20 percent in patients, and when you add it to a statin, you're getting another 20 to 35 percent LDL reduction there. Here is a helpful guide from a paper that was put out actually by a group here at Emory looking at different uh, statins and ARV regimens. As you can see up at the top, atorvastatin, you may want to decrease your dose a little bit um, and interacts with some NRTIs that may need a higher dose, but you're usually safe starting at 10 or 20 milligrams and going from there. Um, rosuvastatin has some minor interactions with uh, PI called atazanavir, no interactions with NNRTIs. You may want to start that one a little lower, around 10 milligrams, and work your way up from there. Um, but both of these are safe to use in patients on antiretrovirals. So how do we risk stratify these patients? Um, it's even more imperative to stratify these patients uh, to guide risk factor management and ART choice given their increased risk of coronary artery disease. There are several risk models that are available. Um, of course, we've got Framingham score, ProCam, the pulled cohort equations. Um, there's one model, the DAD risk equation, which was developed out of that DAD study um, that adds to the Framingham score with things like a family history of cardiovascular disease as well as duration and current use of certain ARVs. I mean, there are newer, less validated models, including the VAX model, which looks at an HIV cohort, and the Reynolds score, which incorporate more HIV infection-related variables like CD4 count and CRP levels. This is just a list of the different score profiles that are available, but just to point out that the DAD score and the VAX score are the only two that were made specifically for HIV patients. Um, so a review of these scores showed that Framingham score and ProCam all underestimate the risk of cardiovascular disease in about 20% of cases. Um, the same, same studies show that this DAD equation is the most likely to be the, an accurate predictor of subclinical atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease risk in these patients. And importantly, due to the prevalence of non-calcified and atypical plaque in these patients, coronary calcium scoring may not adequately assess risk in them. And so what they recommend is either coronary CTA or PET scan if you're going to use imaging to risk stratify these patients. So let's move on to cardiomyopathy. Um, there's no real unifying terminology for HIV-associated cardiomyopathy, but it can be categorized broadly into three main manifest manifestations that include focal myocarditis, subclinical LV or RV dysfunction, which includes diastolic dysfunction and asymptomatic LV dysfunction, and symptomatic dilated cardiomyopathy with reduced EF. So there are several um, ways in which this comes about. One is direct invasion by HIV. Now, interestingly, cardiac myocytes do not have CD4 receptors on them, but there was a study that used in C2 DNA hybridization that was able to localize HIV to cardiac myocytes themselves in HIV patients with cardiomyopathy.
It's thought that HIV enters these cell membranes when the integrity is compromised by co-infections with cardiotropic virus like Epstein-Barr virus. And then one endomyocardial biopsy study of HIV patients with cardiomyopathy actually found histologic evidence for myocarditis in 44% of the samples they examined, as well as a high prevalence of cardiotropic viruses. There's also, once again, surprise, surprise, chronic inflammation rears its ugly head. Um, so HIV invades myocardial dendritic and endothelial cells, induces release of TNF-alpha, IL-1 and 6, and other pro-inflammatory cytokines. And it, cardiac MRI data actually shows that HIV patients have a six-fold higher rate of patchy myocardial fibrosis than non-HIV patients. And that pops up in over uh, three-quarters of HIV patients show this on MRI. Um, also, heart itself. Uh, so older NRTIs, AZT in particular, uh, is associated with an eight-fold increased risk for HIV-associated cardiomyopathy. So ventricular dysfunction. Um, one study looked at over 8,000 veterans enrolled in two cohorts and adjusted for age as well as race and ethnicity. They found an incidence of 7.1 and 4.8 per thousand person years <coughs> with uh, HIV-infected versus uninfected veterans, respectively. Adjusting for traditional risk factors, mm -hmm. HIV patients have a hazard ratio of almost two for developing congestive heart failure. This increased risk persists, persisted even after they controlled for coronary artery disease in these patients. Um, patients on antiretroviral therapy with a viral load less than 500 did not have an increased risk of symptomatic heart failure. But another study that looked at about 36,000 HIV patients and 12 million controls um, showed that the prevalence of heart failure was only slightly lower in patients on antiretroviral therapy as compared to untreated patients at a rate of about 6.4 to 7.7%. Overall, looking at different studies, the prevalence of heart failure in HIV patients is around 7.2% compared to 4.4% in controls. And importantly, the Healthcare Utilization Project showed that the age of first hospitalization for decompensated heart failure is a full 20 years younger in patients with HIV, averaging around 53 years old versus 73 years old in the general population. There's one meta-analysis that looked at 11 different studies assessing systolic and diastolic dysfunction in HIV patients who are mostly on ART. Nine studies looked with ECHO, two with NUKE. Um, the incidence of systolic dysfunction in these studies was about 8.3%. Your incidence of grades 1, 2, and 3 diastolic dysfunction were 32%, 8.5%, and 3% respectively. Um, Diastolic dysfunction occurs at an odds ratio of about 2.4 in HIV patients as compared to uninfected patients, even after controlling for age and other risk factors. So what, how do we treat these patients? There's no published clinical trials on the treatment of heart failure in HIV patients. Um, that having been said, standard goal-directed medical therapy should be instituted in all HIV patients with symptomatic LV dysfunction, according to the heart failure guidelines. And this includes devices such as CRTD and LVAD, as well as consideration for transplant. Um, the UNOS guidelines state that well-controlled HIV patients should not be excluded from transplant lists. And available data did not show any difference in outcome of transplant or LVAD in HIV patients who are controlled of antiretroviral therapy as compared to the general population. Heart should be started in all patients not already receiving it, as immune reconstitution and viral suppression may ameliorate some of their cardiac dysfunction. Heart failure really stands out, though, because there's a significant evidence of treatment disparities when it comes to heart failure in HIV patients versus uninfected patients. Um, studies show that compared to uninfected patients, HIV patients are less likely to be optimally treated with antiplatelet drugs, with statins, with diuretics, with ACEs and ARBs, and they're less likely to go undergo coronary angiography, PCI, and cabbage while admitted to the hospital with heart failure. And despite the UNOS recommendations, more than half of transplant centers in the U.S. consider HIV to be a contraindication to heart transplant. So let's talk a little bit about conduction disease. Um, so HIV is, is associated with multiple conduction abnormalities, um, things like AFib, EKG abnormalities, most notably QTC prolongation, and the dreaded sudden cardiac death. Um, so as everybody knows, AFib is the most common form of arrhythmia in the general population. It's a major contributor to comorbidities like stroke and heart failure. One large cohort study that looked at rates of AFib in 30,000 HIV-positive veterans found higher rates of AFib in HIV patients in the general population, especially when you adjust for age, as well as a higher risk of AFib in patients with lower CD4 counts and higher viral loads when adjusted for traditional risk factors. So you can see here this first column divides out by age. That second column is another one of our um, VA cohorts that they looked at rates of AFib in. And as you look when separated out for age compared with all of these other uh, cohorts of AFib in the general population, you're looking at anywhere from a two to four times increased risk of AFib based on age in patients with HIV. 
And when we look at it in regards to CD4 counts and HIV viral loads, we don't see much of a difference until the CD4 counts get very low. So in, age, in uh, AIDS range below 200, we do see a hazard ratio of 1.6, which is significant for development of AFib in these patients. And then with extremely uncontrolled viral loads, over 100,000 copies, a hazard ratio of about 1.8 for AFib in these patients. Um, so analysis of this same cohort actually showed that CHADS2 VAS score was not a strong predictor of thromboembolic events in these patients. Furthermore, it showed that warfarin therapy was actually associated with more thromboembolic events in these HIV patients, even after adjusting for the CHADS2 VAS score with a haz hazard ratio of over 2. Um, this has extremely important implications for anticoagulation therapy, because if we can't use warfarin, we're going to use DOACs. However, rivaroxaban and apixaban are metabolized through CYP34A pathways. Their effects are increased by most PIs as well as integrase inhibitors, and those effects are then reduced by NNRTIs, which really leads to bigotran as the only recommended anticoagulant or the main recommended anticoagulant um, for patients on antiretroviral therapy. However, it has to be taken at least two hours apart from a booster like ritonavir or cobicisat if it's taken um, as part of the patient's regimen. There's no known interaction between any current ARVs and unfractionated heparin or Lovenox, so when in doubt, if one of these patients comes into the hospital, it's safe to put them on heparin. As far as EKG abnormalities are concerned, um, an analysis of that SMART study we talked about earlier found an increase in both major and minor EKG abnormalities in patients with HIV. Seen in about 52% of HIV patients had at least one major or minor EKG abnormality as compared to 16 to 30% in the general population. Um, Although not all abnormalities had prognostic significance, the presence of any major EKG abnormalities and a, a smattering of a few others, but we'll talk about what's really important here in a second, um, were associated with an increased incidence of cardiovascular disease, even after extensive adjustment for demographic, clinical, and HIV characteristics in these patients. Oop. So here's a list of the major and minor abnormalities that they looked at. Um, they adjusted all of these in three different models, one adjusted for treatment group, one adjusted for age plus gender and race, and one adjusted for a variety of covariants. As you can see in this first column, any major ECG abnormality was associated with a significantly increased hazard ratio um, of CVD events in patients with HIV, but if you really pick through the numbers, most of that significance is all driven by major QT prolongation, which has a hazard ratio of anywhere from six to nine and a half for major CVD events in these patients. Um, as you can see here, patients who did have any major ECG abnormality did have a higher cumulative um, rate of CVD events over time compared to HIV patients without any EKG abnormalities. So these are patients when you're looking at their EKGs when they come into clinic or the hospital, even if it's just a small abnormality, something you usually wouldn't pay attention to, might be something you want to pay a little bit more attention to in these patients. So how about sudden cardiac death? This is actually a significant contributor to HIV-related mortality. Um, patients with HIV are at higher risk for most of the common causes of sudden cardiac death. That includes things like coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathy, and fibrosis, heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, and arrhythmia, such as QT prolongation. There was a single-center retrospective cohort that looked at almost 3,000 patients in a public HIV clinic between 2000 and 2009, and in their cohort, sudden cardiac death actually accounted for 13% of their patient deaths, um, and sudden cardiac death occurred at a rate of 2.6 per thousand person years, which is a four and a half times higher rate than in the general population. So overall, when it comes to arrhythmias and heart failure, once again, we have a sort of a complex interaction between <laughs> HIV, downstream effects, and the ultimate manifestations that we see as cardiologists. Finally, let's talk a little bit about pulmonary artery hypertension. Um, so it was one of the earliest complications that was associated with HIV infection, and it has a presentation and a histology that's similar to idiopathic PAH. And in fact, HIV-associated pulmonary hypertension is classified under group one of the WHO classification. Prevalence in HIV patients is estimated to be at about 0.5% with little change from pre- to post-heart era, and that makes HIV patients 2,500 times more likely to have primary pulmonary artery hypertension than patients in the general population. Um, it's postulated that this is, once again, due to increased inflammatory cytokines, and this is really driven by the absence of any viral uh, particles in the lesions as opposed to in cardiac myocytes where we are able to localize HIV to those lesions. Um, as far as diagnosis, echo is less sensitive than right heart cath, but we prefer to use that initially. 
One systematic review found that common echo findings included cardiomegaly, pulmonary artery enlargement, RVH, RA dilation, RV dilation, and TR. When we cath these patients, their mean PA pressure is about 55, mean RV pressure is about 75, um, wedge pressure around 12 with a cardiac index of about 2.6. Now, we do find that both sitin, ART, and prostaglandins are all beneficial to improving hemodynamic and functional status, but there's no correlation between pulmonary artery systolic pressure and CD4 counts. However, there is a significance in the degree of pulmonary hypertension between patients with AIDS and those without. Um, they really don't recommend vasoreactivity in these patients because it's present in less than 2% of them. So, Finally, coming to the meat of the talk, let's talk about treatment considerations for these patients or how we find a balance in care. So since the arrival of Zadovydin in 1987, researchers and physicians have really done a remarkable job at developing and deploying better, safer, and more tolerable antiretrovirals. I found a, a really great quote in one of the papers I read where it said that this really isn't enough. Since people living with HIV live longer, they're adding up all the degenerative diseases that are caused by HIV as well as the side effects of the antiretroviral drugs. And this should encourage physicians and researchers seeking the patient's well-being not only through HIV suppression, but also thinking about other more ambitious goals, perhaps more distant from infectious disease. And I think that's really sort of the brunt of the talk today. And so for patients with HIV, we've done a really poor job of reaching these goals with regards to their cardiovascular disease. And this one's kind of on us. I really think that a lot of that failure comes from fear of antiretroviral drugs. So unless you're an HIV specialist or an infectious disease doc, you know about them, but you're not that familiar with them. They're complex regimens of critical medicines. There's lots of different medications with a lot of different interactions. It's hard to be familiar with all of them from either side, either from the ARV side or the um, subspecialty specific medication side. And let's be honest, there's really big consequences for drug-drug interactions, especially with a lot of these cardiovascular drugs that we use. And so you end up with charts like this, which despite being a really poorly put together chart where they just use different shades of gray and use lighter shades of gray that are more difficult to pick out from the white background to denote the more dangerous interactions. There are a lot of drugs here. There are a lot of interactions. This is looking at a lot of the more common cardiovascular drugs that we use and really just a handful of antiretrovirals. And I mean, you take one look at this chart and think there's no way I can ever account for all of these interactions. It's probably better just to not bother with it, keep them on their ARVs, and kind of keep our fingers crossed with regards to cardiovascular disease. But that's where you're in luck, because if you're going to pay attention to any part of the talk today, you should pay attention to this part, because this is where we're going to go through a little bit how we should choose our cardiovascular medications for these patients. So let's start with antihypertensives. So remember, these patients are extremely sensitive to, to hypertension with regards to especially MI. So this is something we need to be getting on top of earlier rather than later. Calcium channel blockers, in general, you want to avoid. They have significant interactions with most protease inhibitors and NNRTIs, and your non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers also have interactions with most other classes of ARVs. Thiazides, they're safe to use, few if any interactions. ACEs or ARBs, you want to think about selective use. So Losartan and Herbisartan have low-level interactions with Ritonavir, which is one of those booster medications, as well as NNRTIs. Others like Valsartan, Candesartan um, are safe to use with ARBs. Beta blockers also use selectively. Um, most of your beta blockers are weakly going to interact with protease inhibitors and integrase inhibitors. Bisoprolol and carbidolol are also going to interact with NNRTIs, whereas metoprolol, atenolol, and propranolol do not. For heart failure, ACEs, ARBs, and beta blockers, just like we talked about. Furosemide is safe to use, no real interactions. Torsemide, used selectively. It weakly interacts with ritonavir, which is one of those boosters, as well as NNRTIs. Spironolactone, also safe to use. Also, for any heart failure people out there listening, remember CRTs, LVADs, and transplants are also safe to use in these patients. As far as anticoagulation, we talked about this at length earlier. You want to avoid warfarin in these patients because of that increased thromboembolic risk in HIV patients. Rivaroxaban and apixaban, in general, you want to try and avoid them unless you have a patient who's on a very particular regimen. Their effects are increased by most PIs as well as integrase inhibitors and then reduced by certain NNRTIs. This leads to bigotran as our main go-to anticoagulant in patients with HIV. However, it must be taken two hours apart from any medicines that include that booster ritonavir, heparin, lovenox, aspirin, safe to use. Antiplatelets, aspirin is safe to use. Clopidogrel, we want to avoid. Ticagrel, we really want to avoid. So clopidogrel can have 
levels reduced a little bit by certain medications, ticagrelor can have them dangerously reduced. So really try and avoid uh, Berlinta in patients on ARBs. Prasugrel safe to use. Once again, give it two hours separate from that ritonavir booster medication. So lipids, rosuvastatin, safe to use. Maybe we want to start at a little bit lower dose, but when I'm emperor, we're going to put rosuva in the water supply. So just go ahead and start it now. Um, atorvastatin you can use selectively. You do want to avoid it in patients who are on darunavir, which is still a pretty popular protease inhibitor in patients with HIV. And you want to use lower doses with PIs and NNRTIs. Pistavastatin, safe to use but expensive. Um, no known significant interactions with any ARVs. Um, azetamide, safe to use and effective. But this is also a two-way street. So there are multiple studies, I'm not going to get too much into the weeds because we're running short on time, but just know that there are multiple studies that show that switching from certain ARV regimens to other ARV regimens does have a favorable effect on metabolic profile, including raising HDL, lowering LDL, and lowering triglycerides. So if you have a patient that's tough to control or you're having a difficult time getting them on the right medical regimen, talk to their ID doc about possibly switching their ARV regimen to something with a more favorable metabolic profile. So what about future directions? Um, although we have treatments for the mainstream effects, we still don't have a definitive method for dealing with the most likely culprit in these patients, which is this chronic inflammation. Like we said earlier, rosuvastatin has been shown to have some anti-inflammatory effects. They looked at prednisone, they saw a decrease, of, and a, a decrease in immune activation as well as increased CD4 counts, but this really came at the cost of increased viral loads as well, so it was kind of a wash. Um, but there are actually several trials investigating various anti-inflammatory mediators that are ongoing and currently recruiting. Here is a list of just a few of them, some looking at antiplatelets like aspirin and clopidogrel, others looking at more classic anti-inflammatories like methotrexate, colchicine, and pentoxyphylline, as well as some newer biologic agents like canakinumab. Um, in conclusion, running low on time, um, patients with HIV, both on and off highly active antiretroviral therapy, are at increased risk for a high range or wide range of cardiovascular disease. And because of that, antiretroviral therapy should always be the first intervention that we do with these patients when it comes to cardiovascular disease. Not only are they at increased risk for disease, but they're also underdiagnosed and undertreated. And with these complex patients, I really think there's a greater need for cooperation between primary care physicians, infectious disease specialists, and cardiologists to make sure that they're being appropriately screened and treated in order to help them realize the full potential of their modern antiretroviral therapy. Um, with Dr. Armstrong here, I think I would be remiss if I didn't mention our IDP clinic, which is either the largest or one of the largest AIDS clinics in the country. And there you have pulmonologists, neurologists, psychologists, women's health specialists all come in to help take care of these patients, but there are no cardiologists that help out there in a, you know, a group of patients that are at extremely high risk. So I think, you know, overall we could do a lot better job working together as two different subspecialties to take care of this extremely high risk group of patients. Uh, these are my references. And with that, I'll take questions. Um, and before questions start, I, I put my email address up here. So I know we covered a lot of information today and went through a lot of things. Um, if there's anything that you want to go back and look at in this presentation, especially that last section where we go through individual drug recommendations, shoot me an email and I'll be more than happy to send you a copy of this so you can keep it in your records. Thank you so much. Oh, we are, okay. I have to run off in a second just to grab a call. So um, that was an amazing tour de force, John. Um, I will just say that it's actually, my, my message would be it is not quite as hard to treat people as um, your last set of slides because I think there are even newer drugs, the newer integrases mm -hmm. that don't have any interactions even with DOEX and are completely mm -hmm. safe. And it is the, um, the rarer patient that we cannot switch to an easier regimen these days that doesn't interact. So. Um, thank you very much for your message to treat people um, aggressively because we can help you manage the drug interactions which have gotten so much easier and are actually relatively uncommon now. Yeah, that, that's one thing that I, I wanted to talk about a little bit, but there's there's just not enough data, is that most of the data for interactions, you know, you look at the NNRTIs and PIs, these are drugs that are really being phased out of these patients' regimens. There are a lot of newer, better medications, and I really look forward to data coming out in the coming years on patients who are on these and sort of how it affects their cardiovascular risk and, like you said, being able to get them on more medications for other medical conditions as those interactions decrease.
Yeah, so if you, if you go back and look in detail, most of those interactions are between protease inhibitors, which most of them are combined with the boosters like ritonavir or cobisistant, or in an RTIs, and like Dr. Armstrong was saying, you know, these days, the most common go-to, you know, newer medicines like um, Tavike, Bictarvi, are focusing just on NRTIs and uh, integrase inhibitors, um, which are sort of the hot new drug for patients with HIV. SGLT2s without any trouble. Yeah, that was good, John, a lot. Um, a quick a clarification and a question. Clarificate, you'd mentioned the CHADS VAS score, how it didn't, so did it underestimate yes. risk? Okay, mm -hmm. that's what I presume. Yeah, okay. and really my big takeaway from that is just it's tough to risk stratify these patients really from any cardiovascular disease perspective because we just don't have data on them. Um, I think the VA cohort study or that VAX score is going to be interesting to look at as it becomes more validated over time uh, and see how that fits in. But yeah, really avoid warfarin, you know, like Dr. Armstrong was saying, we can fit most newer patients on newer regimens on DOACs, but if you're worried, um, the bigger trend seems to be a safe choice. And then my question would be with our current sort of de-emphasizing the role of aspirin for the primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts on the role of low-dose aspirin So, in I, I mean, it's safe. I would start it in these patients. You know, if you go back and look at this, one of the last slides here, um, there are actually a lot of trials that are looking at aspirin and prevention in HIV patients specifically because of its anti-inflammatory properties. So I'll look forward to seeing the results of more of these studies as they come out and see if we can get more data for HIV patients in particular in aspirin. Thanks so much, guys. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.